Jewish day schools in uh, North America are often part of the curriculum. Uh, is it for the sixth grade? Uh, yes, is uh, chapter one of the book of Joshua. Chapter one of the book of Joshua. Uh, and when you walk, go into these schools, uh, day schools, they're uh, very often, I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's going to be some guidelines for the so-called curriculum. But they're so general uh, as to be uh, almost or identical to uh, meaningless, uh, not of much uh, if of any value. So, for instance, uh, for the curriculum guideline for uh, the chapter one of Joshua is uh, a focus on leadership. This is too literal. Literal versus what? Versus figurative. In other words, figurative is symbolic. Another word for symbolic is metaphor, metaphoric, poetic, if you want. Figure is a good word, figurative rather than literal. Because figurative is the root is to figure. It becomes, metaphor becomes a figure. A story is a figure, is a, is a reflection. It's a picture about something do, 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 universal. Something in the experience of all people, in the common, everyday experience of what really matters in our lives. Leadership is not, uh, let alone for our students, for sixth graders, uh, or even tenth graders, twelfth graders, though, it's usually for the book of chapter one of Joshua, the book of Joshua is usually, I think, for sixth grades like in the Schechter uh, schools. So, for, I mean, for children, leadership is not... <laughs> you might talk about peer leadership or something, but uh, it's, it's, it, this is not figuring. It's, it's quite artificial uh, and superficial and general also. It's not nuanced with specifics, really. But again, as I said, in the first stage of curriculum development, we don't think of the child. We don't think of the student, whatever age. It could be postdoctorate if you teach at university. It doesn't matter the age. We do give mind to the students a lot. But not first off. As I say, first off, it's we're teaching ourselves. We're learning ourselves for an adult, for myself. Is there something rich? in this, uh, the so-called subject. Because education is uh, the collaboration, an invitation to collaborate, to participate in the spiritual, ethical, character development, life, and spiritual, ethical, character, experiential struggles and joys, life, to participate in that life, to collaborate together in, in the spiritual character development of uh, our students or people. And to collaborate, to participate means to share of ourselves as well, sometimes explicitly, directly, sometimes uh, indirectly, implicitly. So for ourselves also, I mean, leadership. Uh, all right, we just had a presidential election in the United States. We're about to have one in Israel here. So for the adult citizen of his or her society, certainly leadership uh, is often a fateful issue. But actually, in the everyday life, I mean, it's really that isn't what figures, what figures, figurative rather than literal. So, what do we find? What what did I find? What do I find the last time uh, that I prepared to share with others, commonly called teaching, to when I prepared to invite 
sixth graders to join with me in exploring chapter one of Joshua. Again, what did I come up with for my first stage of developing what to share? The first stage is, do I have anything for myself in relation to chapter one of Joshua? I can't share with others something unless the something is rich, has nuance. Is very comp it, it, I mean, it can't be very compelling. Is comp is very by definition it can't be very compelling. Here. It has to be compelling for me. Then I have to think of who am I teaching? Are they uh, is their age such that they're into uh, concrete so-called uh, thinking, perceiving, or is it uh, abstract, conceptual, or what are the compelling experiences in their lives. Actually, we see an example of that in uh, the film A Serious uh, Man. Sexuality, bisexuality. Right? This is ongoing, different questions about it at different stages of, the, of human development, of the life process, aging through uh, infants, through child, through, you know, Adolescence and uh, early adolescence, middle adolescence, later adolescence, early adulthood, adulthood, uh, midlife, adulthood, old age, etc. So, um, yes, in the development of, you know, across uh, the human being, uh, sexuality, there's all kinds of the, the questions change, vary for each developmental period or stage. But for uh, adolescents, uh, already early adolescents, but especially, of course, for middle uh, and, and, and later, though later adolescence is quite a bit different. Uh, but say for bar mitzvah age, for the children in the uh, film A Serious Man, uh, that's a that's a big question. And belonging to the, their families belong to the middle class is pretty much a given. I mean, it's not uh, they don't even they don't really can't imagine uh, uh, the really wealthy wealthy, and they can't really imagine the poor and the struggling who aren't in the middle class uh, or those in between those in between uh, poverty and uh, the middle class, where everything is such a struggle. I mean, it is for the middle class too, but I mean, an incredible struggle. They, they don't think about that generally, depending again, like everything, on their parents, what they're exposed to, what their parents think about and are aware of in their society, etc. But generally speaking, uh, also for the parents, it's, it's only a minority of parents who are. So, so what are they really thinking about? I mean, and thinking about means really, I mean, thinking about, but living about. And that will mean experimenting about. It will mean experimenting about. <laughs> Some parents, most parents don't want to know that. Uh, uh, but it's happening. And it's, uh, it's healthy to, to a, a very reasonable, uh, to a very large degree. But of course, it's dangerous, too. I mean, living is dangerous. Uh, and growing, experimenting is part of is part of growing, especially at those stages. But later on, too, if we want to continue growing instead of just uh, becoming an imitation of ourselves, or uh, so. Uh, and then there are other elements, dimensions to what is really compelling in the uh, experience of our students. Uh, questions of meaning. Is there and belonging? Music. Uh, questions of uh, lonely, uh, loneliness, aloneness, togetherness, uh, friends sharing what we're going through. Emotions. Very, very uh, prominent. Trying to figure out, uh, you know, life. What the hell is going on? <laughs> what, what meaning are we to understand? And uh, poetry, music, uh, popular music, yes, with its lyrics or uh, with its just loud noise, or soft, uh, 
can uh, it, it, it tends to be very uh, salient, very compelling for uh, this is the very again, compelling for young people, and we see that in the film. Uh, it's the book of the month records, not the books. Uh, I mean, some young people are avid readers also, you know, but uh, more often than not, it's something more emotional, more uh, yes, there's a certain immediacy to music. And often uh, there are types of music, whether it's blues or uh, rock or, I don't know, garage or whatever it's called, uh, um, that is uh, antisocial, that is criti social, critical of uh, society and of the adults. As I mentioned, uh, I think in my last video uh, piece, already with early adolescents, but certainly middle and later adolescents. You know, we are talking about family education for a couple of decades now. It's relatively new in Jewish education. But uh, an awful lot of young people, they don't want to have anything to do with their parents, or, or they have very mixed feelings about their parents. Actually, all ages do. You know, in Cinderella, you've got the wicked stepmother and the fairy godmother. Uh, I was reading to four-year-old Ayala once. Now she's, you know... Uh, 34, I don't know, 44, probably. Like four, I don't know, 44. So, um, reading the book Cinderella, and I bought this uh, book for her that was beautifully illustrated. I th and she kept wanting to have it read over and over again. You know how she, children are like that, and you know the parents or uh, the adults are practically begging. You know, uh, the child, uh, can't we read something else? <laughs> And I thought it was because uh, of the wonderful illustrations. But one time we're reading it, and there was one part she particularly wanted to be read over again and over again. And she said, oh, uh, read the part about uh, Ema, I mean the uh, wicked stepmother again. You see, we feel toward our parents uh, that sometimes we feel towards them like they're the, uh, they're the wicked stepmother, sometimes the fairy godmother. We have mixed feelings. So, um, independence from parents, which means uh, finding camaraderie and uh, who to talk to with the friendship. These are the issues which, uh, kind of issues which are most compelling. And, uh, and, uh, and being alone with one's music, you know, and uh, uh, turning up the volume loud and uh, etc. So, uh, seeking meaning. It's a wonderful scene there with uh, Marshak, you know, with the chief, with the head rabbi, uh, and um, who sees the bar mitzvah. It's about all he does now. Uh, they come into his uh, study, you know, which seems to have all the questions of uh, of meaning, Jewish and otherwise, universal, to make in his off in his, as it were, office, his study. You know, and you walk in, and it's. You know, it's a little scary, and it's a little and, and very intriguing, and full of mystery. And uh, one sees that here is a rabbi, someone connected with Judaism. From based on most of my, or all of my Hebrew school teachers, I would think, uh, you know, and what goes on in the temple, a uh, so-called temple. I mean, and from what my parents' relationship with Judaism is, I would think, uh, you know, there's not much that's compelling in Judaism vis-a-vis -vis the big mystery questions of uh, life, uh, but here I see that there are, and then I see that this rabbi, this, uh, this real, this special person of some sort, uh, represents another kind of Judaism that I didn't know about, uh, is very taken by the music that I'm taken by. He was listening to on my, uh, on my little Walkman. And um, pronounces the names of the band members as the sa sa sacred uh, tonality. And that speaks to uh, the young person. Well, I suppose almost anything would, since he's uh, high on uh, marijuana and uh, he was smoking in the bathroom right before uh, uh, saying his, uh, uh, chanting his uh, haftarah. The reading from the prophets uh, the synagogue for his body and stuff. But um, 
So we're going to ask the question of who is the student, and according to what different theories of uh, psychological, spiritual, ethical character development, such as Eric Erickson's stages. For example, he says sixth graders. Well, we'll come to that in a moment. <laughs> So we're going, that's crucial, in, obviously, in teaching, in curriculum design, curriculum development. But first you have to have something to share that is compelling, something that is rich, and that's going to be between you and yourself, that for adults, for you yourself as an adult. Then we turn and think, say, okay, who is, what are the truths of my student? But first, is, what are some of my truths? Uh, when I study, when I take a look at the subject, so-called subject, that I uh, seek to uh, share with uh, my students. First, do I have something to share <laughs> with them? These are in relation to the subject, in relation, we are in relation. So uh, I take a look at chapter one of Joshua, and I see that there's certain words that repeat. Chazak the Amats, the divine uh, Romi that will I, I want to speak to your question. I mean, there's a character in the Bible, one of the characters uh, in the story, so-called, I call them dramas, in the narratives. Uh, one of the characters is uh, God, uh, the divine. So what is, what is that character all about? You have to have an idea. Uh, all, anyone who's going to teach Bible, to share Bible with others, have to teach people about it. Through, to educate people, to expand, which means to expand their spiritual character, ethical development, so-called spirit or soul or something, life, uh, through encounter with the subject, be it mathematics or Shakespeare, in this case, Bible, in this case, chapter one of Joshua. So, uh, does one have to believe in God in order to teach Bible? Uh, no. But, yes, but yes, one would have to have developed a, for oneself, first, for oneself first, an appreciation of the uh, depth of meaning that the character called God, uh, the divine, in the Bible uh, involves, reflects. I mean, you don't believe in uh, so-called fiction. I mean, you don't believe in Harry Potter, do you? I mean, as a historical person, or King Lear or Macbeth, or Hamlet. They weren't historical individuals, so we don't believe in them as existing in any scientific or historical or literal way. But if we appreciate uh, Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, drama, then we appreciate that there's profound truth compelling commanding the Jewish divinity, commanding truths that the character uh, Hamlet or Macbeth or Harry Potter or whatever uh, reflects, involves. And then we'd have to, of course, give thought to the specific elements, dimensions of, uh, of what is uh, compelling what is value of value uh, in this that this character uh, reflects brings up represents but okay more on that uh, in, a, in a separate uh, a second uh, a video that I'll, I'll try to make but I come back to myself I'm looking at it so at first I look at chapter one of, uh, of Joshua myself what do I find in it and I see certain words repeat. Chazak the Amats, be strong and of courage, the divine, the character of the divine speaks, says to, repeats to Joshua. 
also repeats a couple of times, a few times to Joshua. Ka'asher hayiti im Moshe, eya imach. As I, with, as I was with Moshe, I will be with you. In the way, in the manner that I was with Moshe, I was close, supportive, critical, and challenging, demanding, but also supportive, company, maybe sometimes hiding or uh, letting, um, letting, allowing, in this case, Moshe to make mistakes or to find his own way. But in the way that I was with Moshe, I will be with you. Which is not similar to saying, you know, be strong and of courage. You know, it's, uh, why would someone say that to someone else, especially repeatedly? It must be because the person it's being said to uh, doesn't feel confident before some challenge. In this case, Joshua taking over the leadership of the people. Yes, leadership of the people, but that's not what the story is. That's not what is most compelling in the story. In the, in the story, in the I call them dramas because the word story sounds very you know. Oh well, that's just a story, you know, like the children or something. But of course, we know it isn't really true. And when we say that, what we mean is uh, historically true, literally true in a, in a sense, meaning historically or scientifically. But that's not the only kind of truth. Uh, there's also the truth of music and literature, religion, art, dance, theater, films, books, literature, which are, they are, it's different kinds of, it may not be historical or scientific truth, very often it's not, sometimes it can be both, but uh, very often it's clearly not, but it's, uh, or it has maybe some kernels of historical or scientific truth, but what the truths they are really about, and they're conveyed via, are really about it, are ethical truths, psychological truths, philosophical truths. Uh, uh, political truths, economic truths, which ultimately are ethical. But of course, all those are according to some uh, point of view. Yeah? Uh, oh, yeah, sometimes I carry this around, you know, in my pocket. You know, you know, and I, I put it, you know. Uh, everything, everything is, is usually said in a generality, in, in very general terms. You know, and then if we ask, is it true? For example, is it true that there's God? Well, that depends. It all depends on how one understands the word God. What does that word refer to? Do I believe in democracy? What do you mean by democracy? The two presidential candidates in the United States just now have two very different ideas about what democracy is, what a more compassionate America is, what a moral, ethical America is, what a responsible government is, society, etc. So I look at that and then I say to myself, I look at the end of chapter 1 of Joshua. And then I say to myself, well, do I see anything in my experience which is similar? And I say, well, uh, yes. It's been very important in my life. Some individuals, uh, older individuals, who teachers or the director of camp, uh, Tel Yehuda, when I was on the staff for 18 summers, he was for a lot, most of the summers the director of Uruguay. People who have been very encouraging, affirming to me, affirming, letting me know explicitly and implicitly, directly and indirectly, that they felt that uh, I have something special uh, that's, uh, to share. And first of all, just something special that's between me and me. I mean, it's me. Uh, 
and then it can come to expression in all of my interactions with uh, the world. Trees and birds and people, uh, if I'm working with art materials, whatever it is that I'm interacting with, whoever it is. And that's a very, uh, very, very profound uh, experience to feel affirmed in that way and encouraged. Uh, because we do have self doubts, we, we do have doubts about ourselves. And uh, this, this can be, I think, is critical in our lives, different ways from people. Sometimes it comes from literature, from seeing forms of encouragement. We're reading a book and we say, oh, I thought I was the only one feeling this way or that way, but now I see in this book, there's, uh, I see the others, you know, whether it's a history, history book, uh, a biography, uh, or so-called fiction, uh, fi so-called fictional characters uh, who weren't historical, true, but who I recognize, I recognize myself, I recognize something universal, human in these characters and uh, sometimes that's going to be that uh, I'm going to find that very uh, affirming and uh, encouraging to me because I see I'm not the only one going through this. So that's that's been a deep experience for me. All right, now I'm going to think about my students. Eric Erickson says that for sixth graders, approximately, I mean, you don't wake up one morning uh, on your birthday or something and uh, suddenly you're in stage four or stage two or three of Piaget's uh, cognitive thinking or of Erickson's challenges uh, for each period of our lives or whatever. Or uh, Lawrence Kohlberg and Cal Carol Gilligan's ideas about moral development, how we think about uh, morality, so-called ethics. These are usually uh, synonyms. Uh, usually, the same mean the same thing, stand for the same thing. But again, uh, they can sometimes mean some different dimension of, of uh, the life of uh, interaction between people. That's what the ethical or moral realm involves the interaction between people and the judgments, the, val the, va the valuing of uh, those interactions, what they are, what they ought to be, I mean, what they ought to be in this sphere of ethics or realm. Um, and so uh, Eric Erickson says that if, if, so, so whatever the developmental theory is, if someone's at stage three or four or whatever, uh, it doesn't mean one day you wake up, uh, you know, everybody who, when they their ninth birthday, they enter a different stage. It varies from person to person, you know, it's approximate. But Erickson says that approximately for the sixth grader, um, he brings uh, dilemmas challenge for each age period of life. And the one for the sixth grade he calls inferiority versus competence. Inferiority versus competence. I remember when I was uh, 16 or so uh, and my uh, brother was uh, 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 nine or ten And uh, I come home one day, and he announces with great, you know, a sense of achievement. I mean, I don't know, like uh, he had just discovered the, uh, figured out the relativity theory of Einstein or something. I've made the salad tonight. All right. I thought to myself, uh, <laughs> what's the big deal making a salad? It's not a... <laughs> You know, this is not uh, rocket science making a salad. But Eric Erickson, right, in saying that this is the key challenge, or one of the 
<laughs> the way you put it is that's that's the most pressing challenge for the uh, you know, the eight or nine ten year old competence inferiority versus competence that was a way of expressing that challenge that dilemma and uh, he succeeded the competence went out there. That's Joshua, chapter 1. Afraid, as one of my sixth graders, then when we studied uh, it together, chapter 1 of Joshua said uh, Joshua was afraid he'd goof up. Joshua was afraid he'd goof up. Well, uh, she was really saying, uh, we're all afraid. We, and I'm also frequently afraid that I'll goof up. So God said, be strong and of courage. As I was with Moshe, I'll be with you, the people also said, we're going to do whatever you say. But then they add, actually, uh, they add a, a condition. Uh, only, rock, only if you do according to uh, uh, the divine, what the divine you know, uh, expects of us. Well, of course, that's very subjective, so to make a, evaluate, an evaluation, evaluation of that, a judgment of that. So there is actually a condition of that. We don't just accept what the government says because they're the government or our leaders. There's, there's an issue of leadership. Uh, Martin Buber says that... Um, uh, so leadership kind of comes in here, but... Uh, Martin Buber says that uh, to be loyal to our group uh, doesn't mean we always agree with what the group does. Be loyal to the group is to be loyal to the ideals of the group. Is again, is the complication and the responsibility and the adventure. Uh, the ideals of the group uh, depends uh, again. It depends. Uh, you know, it all depends according to which person in the group. <laughs> different people in the same group have some different ideas about what its ideals are. And then they should talk about that and argue it and debate it together you know, with their other members. And then they might come to some at least partial uh, common understanding. Hopefully it won't be, uh, hopefully it will only be partial because then it's totalitarianism. Everybody has to think exactly the same way. That's scary and we're in trouble. So one philosophy of life involves loving difference, affirming difference, as well as commonality. Commonality that's reached, you know, freely by, by people who, you know, talk together and think and feel and act together. Uh, but allow for difference also in thinking, feeling, and acting. Uh, so Buber says to be loyal to your group is not just agreeing all the time what the group uh, says. Here in Israel, there's not much, but there's some debate. We have some of our fellow Israelis uh, demonstrating uh, against the uh, operation, so-called, the incursion, uh, the uh, attack, uh, uh, the fighting uh, going on uh, that we're engaged in uh, in Gaza now. So he says, uh, loyalty is not just agreeing with whatever the group, uh, the group is doing. Uh, it's uh, it's loyalty to not what the group, whatever it's doing uh, at any given time, but loyalty to the group is loyalty to its ideals as you understand it. And if you think the group is going against and it's acting the uh, uh, ideals of the group, then you should uh, disagree with the group. And then that, that will be, uh, of course, without violence. Uh, not accompanied by violence. And that will, uh, that disagreement will actually be uh, the expression, the representation your, uh, of your loyalty to the group. So this is all, all of this thinking right now is, I, is, is how I think about uh, leadership to some degree, but especially uh, what encouragement and affirmation and feeling that I, you know, I'm going to uh, goof up or that I, am I going to succeed at something uh, the word uh, Moshe repeats all, a lot in chapter 1 of Joshua because he just died. He's on everybody's mind, especially Joshua. And then, it's, But his name, I think, always there is repeated with 
almost always Moshe Eved uh, Hashem Eved Yud In other words, he succeeded to be the servant of God, and Joshua is concerned, "Will I be? Will I succeed? How can I succeed to be the servant?" Well, I won't be able to be like Moshe was because I'm not Moshe. It'll, it'll be similar, but also different. You know, the Hasidic story about Zusia, who, right, he gets he tried his whole life to be like Moshe, and then he gets to heaven in the next life, as it were, and, uh, you know, uh, the angels usher him into some, you know, chambers or whatever, to some halls. That doesn't seem to be, you know, the uh, the highest level, and, uh, and where is Moshe, and where is, you know, you know, so he says, I don't understand, you know, I tried my, I, stro I stro strove, uh, you know, I was striving my whole life to be like Moshe. I don't understand what happened when it gets to an audience with God, and God says, yes, but uh, that's fine and good, but um, that's not really what it's about. You should have you should have been striving to be like uh, Zusia, to find out who, who, what is your special self. I was saying some of our teachers and family members or whatever, or different experiences, uh, affirm and encourage in us There's something special in you, Steve. Find out who, who that is. Find out what is special, or what you have to offer, what you have to offer. Uh, and develop that. And go with that. Celebrate it. Trust it, but of course also, you know, be critical of it on guard so that you can uh, really check it out and, uh, uh, and uh, continue uh, refining it and, and growing. Uh, and so uh, so I, I then start developing the uh, but, but again you see I'm emphasizing for the most part what I'm seeing in chapter 1 of Joshua for me but then I do I start uh, I start a little bit a little bit more and more to think about the student uh, and and what is salient in the student's life? And then again, it's according to. Uh, so I have to be reading psychology. I have to be reading Erickson and, and reading fiction and books and uh, stuff that tells me about human nature of different age groups, etc. So if I'm going to be teaching Bible or Shakespeare or whatever, because they address, they engage these questions. I have to be an intellectual if I'm a teacher of Shakespeare or Bible or the Talmud or the Jewish holidays. If they address in a compelling way, the human situation. Human joys and struggles and searches, attempts to figure out meaning. If there is meaning, what is it? What do we mean by God? And what is the reality we call God's role vis-a-vis meaning? This is all what a serious man is about. It's about a person who isn't at all pathetic. And all these terrible things, small, medium, and large, bad things are happening to the person. Uh, not because of himself. Uh, and he doesn't give up trying to figure out uh, what's going on. What does it mean for our understanding of uh, life and meaning and purpose? God. Religious life, Jewish life, and, uh, Jewish uh, teaching about life. And when one of the rabbis he sees, uh, like in the book of Job, there are several friends, right, who have different, slightly different ideas uh, about uh, the suffering that, that has hit him of different kinds. Uh, remember, one of them says, look, it's like a toothache. It'll just go away. You know? He says, I don't want it to go away. That's a serious meaning. Serious he says, I, I, want to, I want to figure it out. I want to know. And I want to take these questions, these experience, the questions, these experiences are raising uh, seriously. So, but, but at last, I mean, I, I, I ask, what are some of the elements in the experience of my students which, which are similar to elements, uh, I'm sorry, what are some, uh, yes, what are some elements in the experience of my student which are similar to elements in my experience of chapter one of Joshua? And then I, I develop a... Uh, so, and how can I then sh share 
with them through a board game or through uh, role playing or through a piece of a movie, uh, even if it's only five minutes or whatever, or through uh, self discovery in small groups with uh, certain questions that you look at, and then one question leads to another, and there's self this discovery of different ideas in chapter one of Joshua in the small group work. A think sheet on Joshua chapter one, and I'm going to share this with you. Uh, I'm going to put this in, one, in the next section of our so-called timeline. And I ask them questions. The first question is what words repeat in this chapter? The next one is uh, draw a triptychon, a drawing divided into three related parts of this chapter. And then give a title to each. How would you divide the chapter into three parts? And draw either give a title for each section or here I actually say draw a picture for each of the three sections that you see in this chapter one. I'll show you an example uh, in the next video I'm going to make. Look at this question. Compose a prayer. I don't know if you can see that. Compose a prayer you would uh, 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 I'm sorry, I can't see it upside down. Compose a prayer you think Yehoshua might have prayed at the time in the situation described in our chapter. Compose a prayer. Write a prayer that you think maybe Joshua would say at this time. See, what's going to happen there is, because they're looking for the word that repeats, etc. They're going to be identifying their own doubts and anxieties about, maybe I'm, I might goof up, you know, before this challenge or this issue or that experience. So really when we say compose a prayer that you think Joshua might say in this situation, we've universalized the situation. And so, or experientialized it. And so, how will this, how will the student write a, a prayer? What will he be thinking of? But uh, he'll actually, to to some degree, unconsciously, he'll be thinking about what Joshua might pray because might be feeling because he'll be she or he will be thinking, well, what do I feel when I'm afraid that I'll goof up? before some new challenge or experience. All right, I'm going to stop here. This is a long video. I hope you can always stop at a different points and, uh, you know, have some vodka or scream or, you know, run around the block and then maybe, uh, you know, if you're uh, courageous, which I realized a number of years ago, courage has a lot to do with uh, stupidity as well. You have to be a bit stupid or foolish to be courageous to go into something. You, know, you have to you know that uh, is uh, daunting and... Uh, difficult and perhaps absurd or impossible to some degree. All right, so I'm going to stop here, and uh, I'm going to go out to try to teach to share with uh, some uh, one of these gap year programs after high school uh, for a course that I teach called the Genesis Parables, again, on understanding Genesis, approaching it, reading it, not as historical truth or scientific truth, but as ethical, psychological, philosophic, etc. truth. Uh, and then when I come back, I'm going to make another uh, uh, video uh, to continue uh, uh, the direction I'm going in, even if you're not sure uh, where it's going. The direction has to do with uh, celebrating this first stage, especially, of, uh, but then its connection with the next stage of, in curriculum development, uh, the next two stages of uh, what are my truths, what is the truth of the stu some truths of the student, and what elements might be uh, similar in the student's experience, which are uh, uh, two elements in my truths, meaning the truths that I'm uh, locating uh, in the interaction between me and uh, the subject, the text, the chapter, whatever it is that I seek to so-called teach or share with, uh, with my students. Okay, for now, uh, uh, for now, um, 
Bye-bye.